Okay, I'm going to step in here because it's 2.01. For people who think they came in late and we've already started, we've just been gabbing <laughs> getting to know our speaker. So I am Becky Strickland. I'm the secretary of the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. Welcome to our February 21st meeting. Fact support, supports science, reason, critical thinking, and science education. We encourage the thorough investigation of controversial or extraordinary claims using scientific methods. Please see our website, www.fact.org to join for $25 a year or and or to donate to our general operations or science fair prize fund. Your membership and donations help fact sponsor quality speakers like Michael today. Um, also helps with our Zoom and meetup costs and activities such as our annual summer picnic, which will be this year will be, oh, I cannot find it now. I think it is July 24th. July 24th. I will, thank you. I will get that information out. Um, we'd like to give a, shot, a shout out to Scott Snell and his National Capital Area Skeptics down near DC. We've been sort of partnering off and on for 20 years or more. Now some information about our Zoom meeting. If you've looked at the bottom of the page, there is a chat box. That is for all participants to talk to each other. There is also a Q&A box for questions. I will be monitoring the Q&A box. Um, you can type them in at any time. Please make your questions concise. During the meeting, oh, whoops, I already said that, sorry. Um, that is all. Our speaker today is Michael Marshall and Eric Krieg will introduce him. Hi, yes. Welcome, everybody. Um, while we are waiting for real science, the kind that we like to promote uh, to prevail over COVID, uh, we, we've been getting people farther distant away as speakers, but uh, when we can meet in person again, then we'll be back to local Americans. Around 50 years ago, I was totally inspired to be an engineer by watching the landing on the moon. I, I just thought it was amazing. And not just me, but everyone at the time was wrong in a couple different ways. We thought uh, by now we'd be on Mars and other places. And none of us would have guessed that after all this time, there'd be people who would not only deny that that amazing event took place, but deny the round earth that you could clearly see in the pictures of, of the astronauts. And that uh, leads me to uh, the speaker of today, uh, Michael Marshall from the UK. He's the project director of the Good Thinking Society. He's been editor of The Skeptic and president of the uh, Merseyside uh, Skeptic Society. And he regularly speaks on uh, uh, about the pseudoscience on the Be Reasonable podcast. His work has been organizing um, international homeopathy protests, going undercover to expose psychics and quack medics, and co-founding the popular QED conference. He's written for The Guardian, The, uh, the, the Times, and The New Statements. So uh, uh, please uh, uh, join me in welcoming, uh, even if it's only clapping your hands in your room, for our speaker today, uh, Michael Marshall. Take it away, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. And um, I I've got to say thank you, first of all, for uh, for inviting me. Um, I was beginning to think I wouldn't have the opportunity to do uh, an international talk to an international audience, uh, given the, the COVID lockdowns. So it's always uh, always a pleasure to be able to speak to people from from all parts of uh, the very round, uh, the very round earth on which we live. Um, so if I just uh, jump to my, my slides here. Um, You've given a, a very kind of useful background to, to myself, but in case people aren't too familiar uh, with, with who I am and what I do. Um, so I was one of the co-founders of the Merseyside Skeptic Society here in Liverpool, where I live in 2009. And uh, one of the reasons that we set that group up, and I imagine it's quite similar to, uh, to, to the reasons that your own group set up, is that we wanted a place where people could come who liked to question things, who didn't necessarily uh, ascribe to particular dogmas, um, and also to build a community around something because if you were religious, for example, um, there are 
there are buildings in pretty much every city in the world filled with people who agree with you on many fundamental things that you can just turn up to a city and you know where to go for where there's people who are going to agree with you and you don't really necessarily have that uh rooms where people get together to not believe in stuff and that's kind of why we uh, we set up as the the skeptic society to in 2009 and we've always had this activist mentality so right from the very start uh we were putting on events but we we're also trying to engage with the pseudoscience around us so we'd go to mind body spirit festivals and we go to spirit church, to spiritualist churches and psychic shows and we try to understand what was around us and try to push back and from that activist mentality, I actually in 2014 uh, became the project director of the Good Thinking Society, which is a, a charity run by Simon Singh, a science writer who uh, many of you uh, viewers may even have read some of Simon's books. They're uh, international bestsellers. And um, it's now my full time job to investigate that stuff. And it's quite a, a privileged position. I totally appreciate that not many people get to do uh, that kind of work. So I'll go along undercover and, and check these things out and I'll work with the media and I'll work with the regulators and I'll occasionally even work with the police to expose things that are particularly dangerous or where people are being uh, very misleading. And then another part of my work uh, with the Good Thinking Society is to travel around the UK and occasionally around the world telling people about the work that we're doing to try and encourage them to uh, see the world through a critical thinking lens, to uh, to explore the pseudoscience around them and to try and find ways that they can push back. And so it's literally my job to go to rooms filled with strangers and try to encourage them to doubt stuff. And uh, whenever I tell people that's my job, there's always somebody in the audience looks at me as if to say, that's not really a job, is it? Um, and to that person, I always say, well, that's how good I am at making you doubt stuff. You even doubt the validity of my own chosen career. Um, but while I've been doing that kind of activism uh, since uh, since 2009, at the same time, I've got this other project uh, called Be Reasonable, which is a, a podcast that I do where I interview people we would disagree with. But rather than have the kind of conversations that you'll typically see playing out on Facebook where skeptics talk to believers in alternative medicine or believers in psychic abilities or conspiracy theories, instead of having that kind of heated back and forth, I try to have a much more uh, collaborative, polite, reasoned conversation where I'm trying to understand as much as possible why people come to these uh, extraordinary beliefs and then try to introduce gentle challenges in a way that isn't going to break the conversation so we can hear as much as possible what's actually going on in the minds of somebody who believes in these unusual things and that that runs right across the gamut from people who believe there are still pterosaurs flying around america right now and the only reason we don't see them is they're very good at hiding um so from that very uh fun end all the way up to people who i've interviewed who are white supremacists people who are selling cancer cures fake cancer cures to people really quite damaging stuff aids denialists and i, I try to understand as much as possible what they believe and that's really how I came across the topic I'm going to talk about today, uh, the Flat Earth. It was actually the second episode I ever did of the of the, of the Be Reasonable podcast. We interviewed someone from the, the Flat Earth Society because I was really charmed by the idea that in this day and age, there is still a group of people who think the world in which we live is flat, despite all of the evidence we've seen, not just throughout uh, uh, you know, the, the education that we have, but throughout suffused through culture uh, and our cultural history that have demonstrated the round earth and even and shown us the round earth. The fact that people can turn that down and, and turn towards a flat earth, I found a really fascinating idea. And when I first came across it, it was, it was an incredibly small uh, group of people, a very small society, which is why it was a surprise a few years later uh, to see that uh, the Flat Earth suddenly exploded. There suddenly seemed to be this, this huge rise in popularity from when I first saw it in 2013 up to 2018, uh, which is probably where it reached its height, where there was a documentary on Netflix called Behind the Curve, which I imagine some of you will have watched. Uh, there was a chap who tried to prove the world was flat by building his own rocket, and he actually went on to die in that rocket later and there was articles all over the news and even billboards saying research flat earth and i remember walking down the streets here in liverpool and seeing a sticker on a lamppost saying research flat earth and it, it seemed extraordinary to me that it had become such a a part of mainstream society to have this conversation when I'd seen it begin to, you know, five years previously in 2013 be such a small thing. And I think because I've been watching it for those five years, I think it can explain a little bit about how that rise happened, uh, what what touch points uh, set off the virality of that uh, belief system and, and what that belief system actually did to people. And that's really what I, what I want to focus on. Um, but to do that, it's worth doing a little bit of background on the, the history of the modern flat earth belief. 
So in 1838, it really starts uh, in, in the kind of form that we still know it today with a chap here called uh, Samuel Rawbotham, uh, who's an evangelical creationist who wants to prove that all this evolution, newfangled nonsense can't possibly be true. Uh, any of these kind of any of the scientific discoveries that are starting to doubt biblical literalism, none of that can be true because the world is flat. He's seen it with his own eyes. He can demonstrate it with some very easy experiments. And if those experiments are, are true, that all of the science that's built on the idea of a round earth and all of the scientists who agree with that must be wrong. And if you point to certain passages in the Bible, you can argue that they're suggesting the world is flat. So it was really a, a biblical literalist position from day one. And one of his experiments that he did was to uh, go to a, a canal, the Bedford Level Canal here in the UK. Uh, and uh, he would get in a, a rowing boat and row six miles away from his friend who was stood at the starting point on the shore. And uh, looking at the, the calculations of the, of the Earth's curvature, after five miles of rowing, he should be beyond the curve. He should have rowed so far away that enough curvature was between him and his friend that his friend would no longer be able to see him. So six miles was certainly far enough that if the world was genuinely curved, uh, he'd be beyond the curve and his friend wouldn't see him. And yet his friend with a telescope was able to watch him the entire six miles. And from this, Samuel Robotham surmised the Earth cannot possibly be round. Now, obviously, what we he wasn't taking into account was the the lensing effect of uh, of the atmosphere, which is actually allowing light to bend in much the same way it does if you look at the edges of a glass of water and you see the the pit, the, the image distorted as you look through it. That refractive uh, that refractive uh, element wasn't something he he was bearing in mind. So this was absolute proof to, of the flat Earth to him. Um, and so he was carrying on conducting experiments like this and, and later in 1870 one of his followers, a guy called John Hamden, um, repeated some of the, the, the initial Bedford level experiment as a bet with Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, whose name you might well recognise, he was the, the silver medalist when it came to the theory of evolution. He got there just after Darwin. So again this was done to demonstrate that these evolutionists were wrong because the earth is flat therefore the Bible's right. So it was very much that to begin with and even though he lost that bet it didn't deter many of Robotham's followers. And then in 1881, Robotham published this hugely influential pamphlet called Zetetic Astronomy, The Earth is Not a Globe. And this is all of his proofs, all of his arguments, all of his logic uh, that, that lay out the case for a flat Earth. And this is such uh, an influential document that many of the flat earthers that we saw uh, in the last five, ten years are repeating arguments that were first proposed, uh, or th at least were proposed in uh, this Zetetic Astronomy pamphlet, right down to one of the most popular flat earthers and one of the most cited, uh, heavily cited recent flat earth manu manuals, essentially, um, actually repeats diagrams from this original 1881 manuscript. So this is hugely influential. And when uh, Robotham dies, uh, an aristocrat in the UK uses her fortune to start the uh, Zetetic, uh, the Universal Zetetic Society, which was a, very much a, a precursor to the Flat Earth Society, a group that was designed just to spread the, the gospel in a very real sense of the Flat Earth to as many people as possible. And they convinced thousands and thousands of people, distributing thousands of, of copies of Zetetic Astronomy and getting people involved in a, in a group. Um, and that happens all the way up until the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, when the numbers start to fall away again. And I think one of the things that started to lead people away from the flat earth belief in the early 20th century was uh, the, the Wright brothers, essentially, and the early uh, experiments with aviation. The further you can get off the ground, the more obvious it is that the world beneath you is, is curved. So I think that's a, that, that was a limiting factor for them. And so the, the society and the Flat Earth movement kind of goes quiet for a while, but then in 1956 it's it's kind of kicked back into life by a guy called Samuel Shenton, who you can see here, when he starts the Flat Earth Society in the UK. And Samuel Shenton is an evolutionary uh, denier, he's a, an evangelical creationist again, a biblical literalist, and he's using, he's picking up these arguments from 50, 60, 80, 100 years ago in order to disprove uh, science once again and prove the Bible's right again. And then when he dies in 71, uh, this chap, Charles K. Johnson takes the Flat Earth Society, transplants it to America, wraps it up with his evangelical church and starts the Flat Earth Research Society of America. So again, still keeping that biblical literalist root right at the heart of it. Um, 2004 is when the Flat Earth Society in the UK was reformed and that uh, by a guy called Daniel Shenton, who I always like to point out is not a relation of Samuel Shenton which I find mind-blowing. This shouldn't be the most mind-blowing thing about this for me, but it's one of them, because I've only ever heard of two Shentons in all of recorded history, and they're both flat earthers, they're not related. I find that remarkable, but that might just be me. Um, 
But this Flat Earth Society that was founded in 2004, you can see the logos of it uh, on the on the screen there. Um, it very much is an online forum where people are arguing about uh, the Flat Earth, where they're sharing their, their various different theories around the Flat Earth and putting putting back and forth around people who are um, believers in one model of the Flat Earth and believers of another model of the Flat Earth. And also it's a forum where people who recognise the world is round go and have arguments with Flat Earthers. And I'll come to those in just a moment. So in 2013, I interviewed the vice president, Michael Wilmore, and uh, I found it a really useful conversation. And, and it's one of the reasons that I, that I did the Be Reasonable conversations in the way I do, because I wanted to learn as much as possible about the position of the person that I'm disagreeing with. And what I learned from, uh, from uh, Michael Wilmore in that conversation was rather than a, homo a homogenous belief system, the Flat Earth, it's actually riven by schisms. And I, I find those schisms really fascinating. So one set of schisms, and it's something that always comes up, uh, people ask, do they really believe the world is flat? And I think this was a real source of schism for the Flat Earth Society when I came across it in 2013, because there was absolutely a cohort of people, probably quite sizable, who absolutely believed the world was absolutely flat. But then there was another group of people, perhaps smaller, um, who knew for a fact that it wasn't, but just enjoyed the intellectual pursuit of arguing a position they knew to be false to see how interesting they could get with their arguments, how esoteric, how off the wall, how convincing could their rhetoric be based on what they knew was a falsehood. So just having fun with it being intellectual trolls. The problem was this group of people were really good at it. And they really convinced this group of people even more. And so it really cemented the belief for some of these uh, for some of these flat earthers. Um, so that was one side of the schism. And I think that the, the presence of this intellectual group of trolls, I think, was quite uh, quite pivotal in lots of ways. Because, as I say, the forum included people who were going there to argue with the flat earthers. And I think this was people who knew just in their core that the world was round had never really thought about it before, but assumed that everyone who thinks the world is flat must be an idiot. And so if they're an idiot and I'm right, I'm just gonna wade into that conversation and tell them all how stupid they are and point out how obviously wrong they all are. But the problem is, those people who were gonna try and correct the flat earthers hadn't really given the flat earth position much thought. Whereas the flat earthers had given it a lot of thought. They were wrong about their conclusions, but they thought about it a lot. So if you go in there knowing that these people are wrong and the only ammunition you have is the first thing you can think of, which you think proves the flat earth wrong. Well, if it's the first thing you can think of, it's probably the first thing they thought of and they're still flat earthers. So they must have an answer for that. And so because people weren't really uh, ed educating themselves about the arguments they were looking to debunk before they went flying into these arguments, not only were they showing themselves to be kind of ignorant and, and uh, unpersuasive, but they were losing the argument partly to the flat earth real believers and really, really to the intellectual trolls who thought all this stuff through and, and really were, were, were having fun picking apart these, uh, these arrogant globists. Um, and so they were losing the arguments and some of those people would have been persuaded to flat earth but others uh, would have you know, gone away with the tail between the legs but the flat earthers who really believe see these arrogant globe heads coming in and having their asses handed to them being proven that they're completely uh, wrong like losing the argument and it really cemented them further so i thought that was a really interesting thing that was happening that kind of emerged from the stuff that i was seeing around the flat earth society in 2013. um so the schism between who believed and who didn't. There was another schism which I found fascinating, um, which was around what shape the world is. Um, because when you think flat earth, you imagine, well, it's kind of like a disc uh, with the Arctic circle in the middle and then all the continents of the world sort of splayed out, the southern hemisphere being spread around the outside of the disc uh, and then a hard wall of ice around the disc and beyond that, who knows? And it might be not a hard wall of ice, it might just be an edge, who knows? And that is definitely one model of the flat earth. But there was a really vociferous schism going on and an argument going on between that model and another model. And this other model said, yes, the Arctic Circle was in the middle and all the countries were, were splayed out around and there was ice beyond it. But instead of it being a discrete disc with an edge, that ice just went on forever in all directions. They believe the Earth was an infinite plane in all directions, which bisects reality which I think is a really lovely idea. It's one of the most charming ideas I've ever heard. An infinite plane in all directions that bisects reality. There is the above and the below, but there's no way to get from above to below because it just goes on forever. And there was a lot of arguments going on between the discus and the infinite plane. And they'd all, they'd each bring forth a different argument and pick apart the, the weaknesses in each other's argument and have this really kind of uh, quite a, a vicious uh, debate that was going on. So there wasn't a uniform version of the flat earth even back then. And people were quite uh, willing to disagree with one another. But regardless which model you had, these models all had drawbacks. 
Uh, and if you think long and hard enough about them, you probably come up with a few of those drawbacks. Uh, but one of those drawbacks was gravity. If you don't have a, a spherical Earth with a center of gravity, a mass in the middle and enough mass to, to pull enough stuff in towards that center, it's very hard to explain gravity. But when people would bring up gravity as a problem for the flat Earth, you had this group of intellectual trolls who very well understood gravity, but were thinking of ways to explain it. And they said, well, what is gravity? Gravity is an accelerating force downwards. You let go of a pen, it accelerates towards your desk at 9.8 meters per second squared, getting faster every single second until it hits the desk, which arrests its acceleration. They said that is indistinguishable from a world in which you let go of the pen, but the desk comes up to meet it. And in fact, the Earth, therefore, to them, was an infinite plane in all directions which bisects reality and is accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. And that's why we get gravity. You don't fall down, you stay still, and the ground comes up to meet you. But people would say, well, hang on, there's a really obvious problem here. If you're uh, accelerating upwards for long enough, eventually you're going to hit the speed limit of the universe, the speed of light. You can't accelerate beyond the speed of light. Your acceleration would have to stop or your gravity would stop. This doesn't make sense. Everything falls apart and we would have hit that point by now. But this group of intellectual trolls are there and they say, well, not so much, because if you look at Einstein's theory of relativity, it says that as you approach light speed, time begins to slow down. So the maths works back out again. They say we're getting faster and faster and faster, but as we get close to light speed, time slows down. And so it to us feels consistent that we're still accelerating. And the people who'd rushed into these arguments because they thought gravity was a problem hadn't thought of that because they hadn't looked up that that's what flat earthers believe and they would fall away uh, at that point. And so I think the sophistication of these arguments uh, and the, the fact that quite a lot of thought had gone in partly from this, this group of intellectual trolls, partly from this other group who really sincerely believed it and were, were really trying to, trying to understand it, I think they came up with quite sophisticated, argument, sophisticated arguments which repelled quite a lot of challenges. But at the same time, their arguments didn't go viral. It didn't explode the movement. It didn't recruit thousands and thousands of members as we saw in 2018. And I think part of that reason is because those arguments were so sophisticated. You had to, to be able to justify gravity in a, in a flat Earth world. You had to have a working understanding of Einstein's theory of relativity, which not a lot of people would necessarily have. Um, and you couldn't stick that argument on a picture and make it go viral on Facebook as a meme. So I think the very thing that was repelling any serious or any half-hearted maybe challenges was also the thing that was limited them from uh, from expanding any further and that's kind of where the movement was up until about 2013 before it really started to uh, explode and I think I can track why it exploded um, but first here's a couple of models of what that flat earth looks like so you can see uh, the first one is the the, the classic disk model the arismuthal equidistant model where the, the south pole is uh, is spread as a diameter uh, of ice and the southern hemisphere is spread around that uh, that outside edge of the uh, of, of the disk um, in the middle you can see Michael Wilmore's modified version where he believes this actually works much better and explains the way that ships can travel around the world and things. And on the far edge, you can see this is just one version of the infinity of ice model. And this model posits that if we are essentially creatures on land in a big puddle in the ice, then maybe there's another puddle in the ice somewhere. And in that puddle, maybe there's land and maybe there's creatures on that land. And maybe that's where aliens come from. So when aliens are visiting us all the time, they're not coming from another planet or another galaxy. They're just hopping across from the next puddle over. And I think this model, I think, illustrates a point which we see quite often in the flat Earth conspiracy theory and in conspiracy theories more generally. I think this model came up when somebody who already believed in alien visitation came across the flat Earth and started to believe it and then found there was a friction between these two previously held belief systems. And rather than it mean one of these beliefs was untrue, they just forced them together to create a hybrid model where actually both these things are true and therefore each one of those things is even more true because they both support the central truth. You know, the fact that aliens are visiting us, it makes sense when you accept that there are puddles in the ice and the aliens are coming from another puddle. That explains both the Flat Earth and aliens even better. So, it, so I think this is what we see with the Flat Earth movement, collecting conspiracy theories and snowballing in that kind of way. But it, it wasn't really starting to explode until about 2015, 2016. And one of the things that really made it explode uh, was this. This is the, I think, probably the most influential video or, or, uh, or ebook. It was released as a PDF ebook and a video um, for, for most flat earthers. The majority of flat earthers I've talked to uh, will either cite this is one of the things that persuaded them, or when they come up with uh, reasons for why the world is flat, they'll be citing almost directly from this book. So they may be citing them secondhand through their favorite YouTuber who got it from this book. 
And this is 2016 from Eric DeBay, who's a conspiracy theorist who believes in all manner of different conspiracies. The Boston Marathon bombing was a, an inside job, 9-11 uh, inside job, that, those types of conspiracies. Um, this was released three years after I had that conversation with Michael Wilmore about gravity and the infinite earth and, uh, and all those kind of quite sophisticated arguments. So you'd imagine they'd had three years to refine those arguments and hone them and make them more robust. But what do we see in this book? Argument number one, the horizon looks flat. Show me the horizon, show me the curve. I can't see a curve. You can't tell me my eyes are lying to me. I know what I can see. There's no curve there, therefore it's flat. Really simplistic arguments, striking at a gut level understanding of what's going on, a gut level understanding of, of what's around you, basic initial observation without real interrogation. They say argument number three is that water always finds its level. You know, water can't stick to a curved surface. It'll kind of always go flat. If you have a bathtub filled with water and you smush it about a bit, it'll be wavy, but eventually it'll fall flat. And when it falls flat, it falls completely straight. And so that we know if you look, everything falls straight. Water can't stick to a curved surface. If it if the world was curved, the water would, wouldn't show that curve. It would have to be flat all the time. And, you, and that doesn't work if you look at a globe where the seas are curved. They say, well, what about rivers running downhill? If you've got hills leading towards a river, this is very clearly downhill. But once you curve that around a flat surface, those hills are actually going uphill to get to the sea and water can't run uphill. They say, what about the rivers on the southern hemisphere? They're going a long way uphill to get to the sea. So a complete misunderstanding of the model they're, they're rejecting when they uh, when they put forward these arguments. They say, what about airplanes flying around uh, the globe when they were flying flying from one place to another rather they wouldn't say around the globe uh, when they're cruising at 30,000 feet um, if they're cruising completely straight at 30,000 feet on a globe surface they would just go off into space the only way they say that a pilot could avoid going off into space is by constantly course correcting the nose of the plane down but if you speak to a pilot they'll tell you there's never a point in the flight where they had to do this to prevent them going off into space so, that, so says the, uh, the flat earther, this is proof that the world has to be flat, it can't be curved. They talk a lot, there's quite a few arguments about the movement of bodies through the air on a spinning surface. So they say, what about a cannonball? If you shoot a cannonball uh, it, from north to south on a world that's spinning towards the, uh, spinning towards the east, I always get that mixed up as to which way the world's spinning, but there we go. Uh, if you shoot a north to south cannonball on a spinning world that's spinning at about a thousand miles an hour, what would that look like if you were stood next to the cannonball? Well, so says the flat earther, the cannonball would leave the cannon and then shoot off at a thousand miles an hour to one side because you and the cannon, uh, you and the cannonball would, sorry, you and the cannon would be spinning away from the cannonball. So on a, on a spinning a surface, you and the cannon, uh, the cannon will be spinning, the cannonball would fly straight, and our perspective on that would be it shoots off to one side. Um, they argue helicopters. How can a helicopter fly around uh, an Earth that's spinning at a thousand miles an hour when a helicopter can't achieve a thousand miles an hour? So it wouldn't be able to overtake the spin of the Earth. In fact, what would happen, they argue, is that a helicopter would lift up and it, the ground would spin beneath it. And if you want to get anywhere, you just lift up and wait for where you want to get to to come to you and land. But they say that's not how helicopters work, so that proves the world can't be spinning because it can't be round, it's not a ball, it's flat. They say if the world was really spinning, we'd feel it. This is genuinely the argument, it's a gut level kind of thing. They say, well, if you're on a train and, you're, and the train's moving at 200 miles an hour, you can tell that you're moving and the, the earth is going five times faster than that. So how come you can't feel it? Of course you'd feel it. Now, obviously what they're missing is very few people ever experience what it's like to not be spinning at a thousand miles an hour on the earth because very few people end up in space uh, and of course everything around us is all, all also spinning at the same speed so the relative speed is nil when we're standing still we're all traveling at a thousand miles an hour but it's a mis misunderstanding of those physics it gets even more simplistic you know 113 argument 113 if australia was upside down people would fall off that's literally what it says 189 the bible says the earth is flat and unmoving Therefore, it must be. That's the argument. Um, the last one there, that's on there, 191. Pythagoras, Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, Neil Armstrong. Well, they were all Freemasons. Therefore, the world must be flat. I mean, one, there's no real evidence that they were all Freemasons. And two, even if they were, that wouldn't mean the Earth was flat. But it appeals to a certain type of thinking. And I think the reason this this ebook and this video is so heavily cited is because there are 200 proofs and they're not all of the same genre of proof. They cover so many different bases. 
if you're someone who relies on your own powers of observation above all else, there's arguments in there that will justify to you why what you see uh, must be true. If you're someone who's more interested in uh, calculations and formula, there's arguments around curvature calculations taken directly from Robotham that prove to you the world is flat. If you're someone who's already a conspiratorial thinker and believes in the Illuminati and the New World Order, there's arguments in there for that too. If you're a biblical literalist, there's arguments in there that you'd agree with. So it takes what's already going to be your weak spot when it comes to believing this stuff, it builds on that, and then once you're in on that first particular point, it presents you, you know, 199 other points that will persuade you as well, once it's already found a chink in your armour. And I think this is why it was so uh, so influential and successful. So that was 2016, and this was one of the things that really lit the blue touch paper on, uh, on the Flat Earth Movement. One of the other things was this chap here. This is Mark Sargent. And Mark Sargent was in the uh, Behind the Curve uh, documentary that uh, many of you will have seen. He's the star of that. And he was a conspiracy theorist who believed all manner of different conspiracies at the same time. So he thought JFK was assassinated by the US government deliberately. He believed the moon landings were all faked. He believed that a civilization used to live on Mars and it carved uh, a face on the surface of Mars. And he said he, he came across Flat Earth ideas in 2014 and he thought, this is obviously ridiculous. I can prove this wrong. And he said he spent nine months trying to prove it wrong. And at the end of that nine months, when he couldn't prove it wrong, he said, I was left with no alternative but to accept it must be true. Now, I would argue there was another alternative, which is to accept that you personally can't prove it false because of the information you happen to have at your fingertips, but other people have information that would prove it false. So don't rely on your own powers of observation and deduction above all else when there's in people whose entire lives and professional careers and research expertise has been in fields that would comprehensively disprove the flat earth. But to Mark Sargent, because he couldn't figure it out, all of those PhDs, all the expertise had to be thrown away, and he had no choice but to accept that the world was actually flat, and, and produced this series of videos uh, called Flat Earth Clues that were released in 2015. And I interviewed him on Be Reasonable in 2017, uh, and he's probably, at the time, was the biggest flat earther in the world, uh, certainly the most kind of prominent name and, and sort of a celebrity figure in that movement. But because I'd had other conversations with flat earthers, I realised it's not necessarily useful to start talking about the flat earth and arguing about uh, the flat earth without first understanding what he means by the flat earth. You know, there's no point in me talking about the, the disc model if he believes in the infinite plane, because any things that I pick up about the disc model might not be relevant to the infinite plane. So first of all, I asked him, what does the world look like to you? What is the flat earth? And he said, well, he does believe in the, the disc model, but he goes one step further and says that disc is underneath a dome. There's a dome on top of the earth, a bit like in the film The Truman Show, he says. And he said it's not even a surprise or a coincidence that it's a bit like the film The Truman Show, because he said uh, the people who know the truth about the world are the same as the people who control Hollywood. And if you're familiar with that euphemism, I promise you we will get to that euphemism. Um, but the people who control Hollywood know full well the world is flat, so they put out the Truman Show as controlled opposition. So that if you started to suspect that the world might be under a dome, people might say, well, I think you've just been watching the Truman Show too much, mate, and dismiss you in that way. So they're, they're putting the truth out there in the form of fiction in order to throw us off the scent and discredit anybody who says that that's true, according to Mark Sargent. And he believes that what happened was in 1960, in the 1960s during the Cold War, when America and Soviet Russia at the time were posturing to try and intimidate one another, one of the things they did was uh, look for, for bases of strategic military importance around the world uh, and also of, uh, for reserves of resources that could be particularly useful. And in both those quests, they turned to Antarctica which is true. Um, but what Mark Sargent says is when they got to Antarctica and really started exploring, they found the edge. They came across the wall and realised at that point that the world was under a dome and had been the entire time. And according to Mark Sargent, at that point in the 60s, the Cold War ended. And everything after that was a phony Cold War designed to keep us, the sheeple who, uh, who, who didn't know the real truth, keep us in the dark and keep us part of the system. So the night from 60s onwards until, uh, until Gorbachev and all that kind of stuff, that was all just a big hoax because America and Russia were working together the entire time, according to uh, Mark Sargent. And he has proof of this. And one of his, his main points of proof was the gravestone of Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun being the, the, the former... Uh, Nazi rocket scientist whose uh, who technology was behind the V2 bombers who was smuggled out of Germany after the Second World War as part of Operation Paperclip and installed into the American space program to use those V2 rocket technology to power uh, America to the moon. Um, and, and when Werner von Braun died, his headstone reads uh, with a quote from Psalms 19.1 
which Mark Sargent argues is proof of the flat earth. Because Psalms 19.1 reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And Mark Sargent says, why would the father of rocket science, whose technology meant to have got us to the moon, why would he be talking on his gravestone about a firmament, the biblical name for the roof on top of the world? The only explanation uh, Mark Sargent believes is that this is a, a post-death confession to say that all that stuff about getting to the moon was a big lie. All that stuff that my technology did was all just propaganda and hoax because actually we can't get to the moon. There's a dome in the way. And while I could live with that in life, I can't let you go on believing that in death. So here's my post-deathbed confession. And maybe that's one interpretation of Psalms 19.1. Personally, I think there's another interpretation, which is all about that first clause, the heavens declaring the glory of God, for a man who saw his technology as the key to the heavens. The reason we're able to get amongst the glory of God in space was because my technology, Werner von Braun, my rockets got us there. We were able to, to witness God's majesty firsthand because of what I did in my life. So maybe it's a post death deathbed confession, or maybe it's just a way of saying my, my work had some real value and my life had value and meaning, especially after uh, what was earlier in my life and, and the, the stuff that was happening with, uh, with the Nazis and the way they used the technology of uh, Van Braun. It could be either way, I'll leave the, the viewer to decide which of those two is the more uh, reasonable interpretation. According to Mark Sargent, uh, because there's a dome, it questions the rest of space. So the stars, planets, they don't exist, he says. Uh, they're just projections on the dome, um, a bit like in a, a planetarium. Um, that's all, all we're in, just a, a giant planetarium. Um, he believes the sun and the moon are real, but they're not planetary bodies. They're light sources, independent light sources that move around outside the dome. And I asked him, well, how are they moving around and what's moving them? He said, well, this is the thing. Because we're not even allowed to accept the truth of the dome, we can't ask the big questions like what really is the sun and the moon and why are they moving and who's moving them? So the, all of that is hidden because we are forced to accept the untruth of uh, the round earth. Um, I did ask Mark Sargent, I was trying to understand how he appraises evidence and whether he can change his position and things. And so I said, you believe in all these different conspiracy theories. Is there a conspiracy theory that you used to believe in that you no longer believe is true? So I thought maybe if we understand how he changes his mind, we can start to appraise uh, and start to use that as a way of talking about logic and evidence. He said, it's interesting you ask me that because I used to wonder why are all these conspiracies true? And then, I, then it all made sense. He said, I used to wonder why did they kill JFK? Well, they killed him because they knew we couldn't get to the moon. We'd have to fake it because you can't get to the moon because there's a dorm on top of the earth because the world is flat. So once you understood the world was flat, everything else clicked into place. It was like the Rosetta Stone of conspiracies. He said, there is some stuff that I still don't know and I don't understand. He said, in particular, I no longer believe there's a face on Mars and I want to meet the guy who invented the idea of a face on Mars because I want to know who put him up to it because I no longer think there could ever have been a civilization on Mars. And I said, yeah, but that's because you no longer believe in Mars. You think the planets are painted on the dome. You don't think Mars exists. That isn't what I meant by have you come back from a position. I think you've gone further in a position. But that's um, that was Mark Sargent. Um, and I think it's no surprise that you know, we've got on YouTube there, Eric DeBay stuff, Mark Sargent stuff. People stumbled across this stuff on YouTube. YouTube for a while was actively sending this stuff to people, actively recommending it to people, recruiting people to the Flat Earth movement because YouTube didn't care what you were watching as long as you were watching. Anything that keeps you watching videos on YouTube one after another with your recommended up next video, the longer you're on there, the more they can serve you adverts and the more they can talk to their commercial partners and say, we have this many people watching this amount of YouTube per day, so our adverts are worth this much. So YouTube's and its entire algorithm was starting to pick out videos that people would watch all the way through, no matter how long they were, that lots of people would watch them because they thought if lots of people are watching these, we can give them to you, you'll watch them, you'll keep being on YouTube and we keep getting our ad money. And the problem with that was YouTube wouldn't be able to understand why an audience was watching a video. So some people would watch a flat earth video because they really believed the world was flat, but others would watch it because it was ridiculous and they couldn't believe anybody could believe that. Some would watch it because they thought it was hilarious at how wrong this stuff was. And others would watch a video 10 times because they were doing a point by point dissection for their skeptical blog. YouTube wouldn't see four distinct audiences. They'd see one audience four times the size and say, this must be a great video. We're really going to start recommending this to people. And that's really how this grew. There was a study from the American Academy of Science where they, uh, Sciences where they went to uh, uh, a flat earth conference in the US and they asked people, what got you interested in the flat earth? And 39 out of 40 of the people they interviewed said, it was YouTube recommended me a video. 
and the 40th person said, my son got me into the idea, he was recommended a video on YouTube. So YouTube had a massive role in, uh, in recruiting people to the Flat Earth Movement and continued to do so even once they were in the movement. People would create their own YouTube videos, but they would go beyond YouTube, they'd even go out onto the streets. And that's what I found in, uh, in Liverpool where I live. Um, this is just near Liverpool. This was a local Flat Earth group uh, preaching the gospel of the Flat Earth on the streets of, uh, of Chester, just, uh, just a few uh, miles away from Liverpool. Um, and you can see here from his uh, placard, Research Flat Earth, 200 proofs. This is Eric Dubay stuff, straight from Eric Dubay. Um, and so this was a local Flat Earth group that meets in a pub. And I thought, I'm going to go at that pub. I'm going to hang out with them for a little bit because I, I was really interested in going along. And I thought, I'm not going there to tell them they're wrong, to laugh at them, to be superior to them, because I don't think that's the right way to go about things. But I'm really fascinated as to why people pick the Flat Earth as an idea to gather around and what they talk about with one another. So I spent an evening in the pub with some Flat Earthers uh, and I found some really interesting stuff. First of all, I was told, never trust any discovery you haven't personally discovered don't trust an experiment you haven't personally carried out because you can't trust that anybody else is saying things to you legitimately that it's not biased you have to have your own powers of observation to observe it and i think that's because in the flat earth movement your own powers of deduction and observation are the primary source of uh, investigating interrogating and, and figuring out the world it doesn't matter what anyone else does or says what expertise they might have what other information they have that you don't have uh, or haven't found um, your own observations ma matter most doesn't matter that you can't have a particle accelerator in your kitchen. You can throw everything that's been done at CERN because you can't do it yourself. So that was the first thing that was a real mantra for them. But another thing they said was, you can't trust photographs. Show me a photo of the round earth and I'll show you a composite job. I'll show you a Photoshop job. I'll show you a hoax because you can't trust digital media. You don't know who, who's, who took those pictures. You don't know what they've done to those pictures. You don't know how they've been manipulated. Digital media, they said, was inherently flawed because photos don't count as good evidence, whereas YouTube does count as good evidence. Here's this YouTube video which proves to you the world is flat. In fact, what they'd say was, here's this YouTube video of an experiment which demonstrates the world is flat. An experiment they hadn't ever carried out themselves, they'd just seen it on YouTube. And I thought that was really interesting because they've got these mantras, don't trust stuff you can't do yourself, don't trust digital media can be manipulated. But when, those, uh, when digital media shows them a, an experiment that agrees with them, those mantras go out the window. You can trust it when it agrees with you. And I think it's interesting because this isn't just, I think, something that's endemic in the Flat Earth uh, movement, but I think it's something that we're all guilty of. The fact that we go away and Google to check is the one we disagree with rather than one that supports our pre-existing beliefs. And I think that's just what's going on with Flat Earth, one of the things that's going on with Flat Earth, but writ large. People are just believing the things that already agree with them, and then the second you find anything that disagrees with you, you scrutinise it in pixel by pixel, frame by frame detail, to until you find a way to be able to dismiss it. Um, so that was that was the, the local meetup groups, but actually it went beyond that. There was actually even a, a Flat Earth a convention in the UK, in Birmingham, in the, in the centre of the UK. There was 160 people met for three whole days at a, at a hotel uh, just to talk about the, the world being flat. Um, it was 158 of them plus me and a friend, because if you're like me and you see there's a conference like this that exists, obviously you buy tickets and you spend three full days in a hotel with people who think the world is flat. Um, again, not to prove to them how wrong they are and how right I am, but just to understand what does that weekend look like? What brings people there? What are the motivations in their lives and the lives of the speakers? And that's what I want to talk about for the next uh, next little bit of the talk. Um, it was genuinely one of the most interesting weekends I've ever spent in my life. Um, it was largely uh, long periods of boredom punctuated by moments of unbelievable brilliance, of like, exciting brilliance of I can't believe this bit that I've spotted. It was, it was a really, really fun weekend. Um, and I saw lots of interesting speakers, and I think the speakers kind of illustrate uh, a lot of the Flat Earth movement. So this is one of the speakers who spoke there. This is Ilo Landucci, who is an Argentinian conspiracy theorist who had a, a popular YouTube channel in, uh, in Argentina, where he'd share stuff about the New World Order and anti-vaccine information, anti-GMO information, 9-11 uh, truth, stuff like that. And he came to believe the Earth was flat in 2014. Uh, here he is on uh, Argentinian television talking about uh, you know the, the Tierra Plena, the Flat Earth. Um, and, and it was, was interesting for a few reasons. 
First of all, there was, a, there was an issue with timing. There was a couple of issues with timing. One of them, uh, when he was introduced by the organ organizer of the conference, they introduced him with a, a bit of a, a funny anecdote that happened. He said, yeah, so Iru was meant to arrive yesterday on Thursday, but uh, there was a mix up and he ended up arriving on Wednesday instead. And we were just talking at cross purposes the whole time. And we didn't realize he was gonna arrive on Wednesday. And we had to race to the, whole, to the airport 24 hours early uh, because he'd arrived an, ent an entire day too early. And they shared this story like it was just a, a fun little quirk about a, a mix up conversation. But I heard it and thought, yeah, I bet that's the kind of thing that happens all the time when your worldview can't account for the international date line. Like these mix up must happen all the time when you can't explain why the date is different in different places on the earth at, at a point. Um, there was another timing mix up uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Iru. Um, he'd been given an hour long speaking slot, but he'd actually turned up with a two hour long talk. And they told us this in the introduction as well and said, so uh, to deal with this, we're gonna do the talk in two halves. And so Iru did the first half of his talk on Saturday morning and it lasted about an hour and a half. And he did, he did the second half of his talk on Saturday afternoon and it lasted another hour. And then he did the third half of his talk on Sunday morning and it lasted another hour and a half. So it was a huge amount of material. But what was curious was, not a lot of it was actually about the flat earth at all. It was about all sorts of other stuff. There was a lot of stuff around symbology and numerology and looking in depth at what particular words might mean if you look at it in this way and squint. For example, he said the UN is a front for the one world order. And we know that for certain because if you look at the Spanish name for the UN, it is the ONU. And if you read that backwards, it's the UNO, which is UNO, which is Spanish for one. So therefore, we know that the UN has to be a front for the one world order because the reverse initialism for it in Spanish is the same as the Spanish word for one. At this point, my friend leant over and says, does Iru realize that UN is already French for one? Because he could have shortcut a lot of that if he just picked a different language. Um, but there was a lot of this playing with words, trying to find scrutinized meaning into, into symbol, symbols that weren't there. He also said dinosaurs, well, they aren't real. The reason they look like a mix of alligators and rhinos and giraffes is because the New World Order paid uh, an artist to invent dinosaurs one day. And he drew on those different uh, animals uh, as inspiration. I think this need to invent dinosaurs and explain them, I think comes back to a biblical literalism that's still suffused throughout the Flat Earth movement. Because if the world isn't millions and millions of years old and old enough for dinosaurs to evolve and die off, then you need to be able to explain them. And so within the last 6,000 years of uh, Earth, uh, 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 the New World Order paid an artist to invent dinosaurs. He also said atheists, any atheists watching like myself, uh, atheists might think that they are that they are not worshipping a god, but actually atheism, he says, comes from uh, Athos, which is a Greek mountain god. So all atheists are actually secretly worshippers of a Greek mountain god, and it may be so secret they themselves don't even realise. Obviously, that is not what the word atheist means. It's not how linguistics work or, or etymology works, but he was quite convinced of it. And there was a point at which he, in his talk, um, he showed something that, that made me draw a sharp intake of breath. Because he said, if we want to really know what the New World Order are doing with the world and what their plans are and why all this chaos is happening, all we need to do is look at the protocols of the elders of Zion, which explains who really runs the world and what plans they've got for the world. And this shocked me because some people might not realize, but the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a well-known, thoroughly debunked anti-Semitic Hawks document. Uh, I think it uh, was originally a plagiarism from, I think it was a satire based on um, the idea of the politician, the Italian politician Machiavelli being in hell and a, a, a dialogue he was having in hell that was repurposed and stolen and plagiarized and translated in Russia uh, to be a verbatim transcript of uh, Jewish elders from around the world talking about what they're going to do to the world. Uh, and it, from from Russia, the propaganda uh, propagated as Russian propaganda <laughs> seems to reliably do, uh, as uh, as we've seen plenty of recently. Um, and it's actually been behind quite a lot of anti-Semitic feeling and even anti-Semitic actions and, and, and atrocities has been based on or at least inspired by and, and founded on the, the Protocols Elder Zion. So I was really shocked to see this talk, this, this weekend that I turned up to to talk about the Flat Earth, suddenly starting to talk casually about a, a, an anti-Semitic hawks and no one in the audience seemed bothered by that. I seemed to be the only one or one of the few people in the audience who actually even registered that this was a, a well-known, thoroughly debunked conspiracy theory. 
So there's more to the flat earth than just the flat earth. And that's an important thing to, to bear in mind. And our next speaker showed us that as well. This was a guy called Dave Murphy, who was, again was a really interesting fella. Um, he was um, a volunteer. Well, first of all, he was a computer programmer and electrical engineer on Wall Street. Um, but he was also a volunteer fireman in New Jersey in 2001. And so when September 11th happened, he wasn't involved in the cleanup and rescue operation, but he knew people uh, who were and he lost people who were. And Understandably, this was a big moment in his life, as it was for everyone in New York, America, the entire world. It was a traumatic thing for everyone to go through. But for Dave Murphy, it meant that four years later, he uh, became convinced that it was an inside job. He became a 9-11 truther and a committed 9-11 truther. And from there, he started to believe in other conspiracy theories, too. And in 2005, he said he had a, a midlife crisis. This is from his website, which led him to an off the grid lifestyle. And since 2011, that off the grid lifestyle has involved drinking his own urine and washing with his own urine because he believes it has all these different health benefits. He believes urine can reverse aging. It's helpful with AIDS, with cancer, with smallpox and with this list of more than 60 other conditions taken directly from his website. And while Dave wasn't talking about his belief that drinking urine and washing with your own urine and injecting your own urine can cure all disease, he was selling books that did say that while he was on stage being the UK's, one of the UK's most uh, prominent and, uh, and visible flat earthers. He was someone that many people in the audience treated as a celebrity. Many people saw his video on YouTube where he was explaining on, I think, Macedonian television why the world was flat. And that was their entry point into uh, the flat earth. And what's interesting about that video, which was like an hour long uh, video where he's talking to this kind of startled uh, TV host who was just not prepared at all to understand the pseudoscience that was in front of him. Um, what's interesting is many of the arguments Dave Murphy was using are indistinguishable from arguments that we saw from Eric Dubay, from Mark Sargent, from Samuel Rawbotham. And I think we have this kind of daisy chaining effect where Rawbotham's arguments end up in Dubay's video, who inspires a, another few flat earthers who come up with, who end up being, you know, Dave Murphy sees those, those people on uh, on YouTube, has a video himself that goes up on YouTube and per persuades more flat earthers. We have this kind of daisy chain of uh, cause and effect with more and more people watching stuff on YouTube and getting uh, radicalized into the flat earth position. And the last speaker I want to talk about in this in this section before I come to some kind of conclusions uh, is Darren Nesbitt, who I thought was, for me, the most fascinating speaker at the Flat Earth Convention. Really, really interesting fella. So he was a flat earth, he's a flat earther who also was uh, involved in lots of other con conspiracy theories. 9-11 truth, the Boston Marathon bombing was a, was a false flag operation, the Illuminati's running the world, stuff like that. And uh, he said he came across the Flat Earth in 2014 and he came out as a Flat Earther, as a real believer in, in 2015. And I interviewed him on Be Reasonable in 2018 and I've actually interviewed him again uh, for the show that's going out next week. Because in the subsequent years between talking to him uh, in 2018 about the Flat Earth and now, He's become one of the UK's most prominent COVID deniers and lockdown deniers and anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers. Uh, and, I, and I think it's interesting that the journey from Flat Earth into that stuff, I, I think, is, is pretty much a straight line. But at the conference, Darren was particularly interesting because he explained his own kind of Flat Earth mantras. And the first one he said was, be your own authority. Don't just believe somebody because they say it with conviction or because they've got an impressive job title or because they're famous as a Flat Earther. Um, check it out for yourself trust yourself rather than the, than authority. And he also said, do your own evidence-based skeptical research. This was one of the first things he said while he was on stage at the conference. And I thought those are quite interesting mantras because I would agree with both of those. And in fact, on the second of those, that's exactly what I would tell a flat earth audience. Do your own evidence-based skeptical research. Although his definitions of evidence-based skeptical research obviously differ from mine. But I think it puts paid to the idea, personally for me, it puts paid to the idea that flat earthers are anti-scientific, that they don't care about science. I think they want what they're doing to be scientific. And they it's not that they're saying science is worthless. They want the science to be on their side. It's just they, are, I think, have other biases and, and weights on them that prevent them from understanding uh, what the science is saying and understanding the flaws in the science that they're conducting. So I don't think it's about anti-science positions and not caring about science. I think it's about trying to make the science fit them. But the other thing that Darren did that I thought was really fascinating was to show this list that he called uh, the, the Flat Earth Questionnaire. And it was a list of 10 questions and they were all yes, no answers you had to ask yourself. And there were questions like, uh, do you find it harder and harder to socialize with people who don't agree that the world is flat? Do you find more and more of your conversations keep coming back to the idea that the world is flat? Uh, do you find yourself thinking that most people's problems would go away if they just realized the Earth was flat? And you could see in the audience people nodding and smiling and nudging their friends as they recognized themselves. They were saying yes to these questions. This described their life. 
And Darren said, this list of 10 questions is the cult red flag questionnaire. If you're saying yes to these questions, this is signs, these are signs that you might be in a cult. And I thought that was fascinating that a flat earther would be saying that to a flat earth conference and a guy who's still a flat earther. And he's saying one of the reasons you might be in a cult is if you believe in this model, the disc model is patently false. It's obviously false. And he listed lots of different reasons why. Um, some of them being that the quicker, the, the longest, to, most time consuming way to get from a point around the earth and back to a point is at the equator, which would be on a disc model here. You know, you'd go through equatorial uh, Africa, through South America and back. When obviously looking at this model, the longest way to get from point A all the way around and back in would be the ice, the diameter. Cause that's how circles work. But observations of people who've actually circumnavigated the globe, he wouldn't use that terminology, but the, you understand the point. Um, observations show that in the northern and southern hemispheres, the further north and the further south you go, it takes roughly the same amount of time to get back to where you started, whereas across the middle is what takes the longest. So this disk model can't possibly be true based on that fact alone. And we've got plenty of evidence backing that up. So we've never seen the wall of ice. There would have been pictures from a drone or a helicopter or a plane or something by now, but no one's ever seen it. There's never a point when you're traveling where you have to turn around and go back the other way. Distances in the Southern Hemisphere aren't hugely stretched compared to the Northern Hemisphere, which they'd need to be in this disk model where you've taken the, the Southern Hemisphere point and stretched it out across the diameter. And uh, a real damning one is constellations. In this disk model, everybody would be looking at the same sky. Yet we know from uh, from centuries of observations that if you're in the northern hemisphere, which in this disk would be the, the middle of the, the, the disk here, you see one set of constellations. But in the southern hemisphere, you see a consistent different set of constellations. So how could it be on this disk model that somebody here in Australia would see the same stars that someone here in South America would see that nobody in the northern hemisphere could see? That doesn't make sense. So this model, you have to throw it away. But Darren Nesbitt says the reason this model exists is controlled opposition. The people who know the shape of the real world are giving you this model to try and throw you off the scent because most people see this model, recognize it can't be true and default back to a globe rather than pushing beyond it to know what shape the world really is. So he had a lot of right ideas, but came to the wrong conclusion. He then proposed what he thought was a more plausible model of the world, where travel across the northern and southern hemispheres would, uh, would take roughly the same time, across the equator would take the longest. And he explained how it was made. And this is a part of a video that he showed uh, where he explained that the world was sitting on seven pillars because the book of Job says the world is on pillars and God likes the number seven. And then he showed this is, the, is what the world might well look like according to Darren Nesbitt. This is a better shape for the world based on observations. And to be honest, this isn't terrible because getting from west to east in the north at the very northern point would take a short amount of time. At the very southern point would take the same amount of time, but across the equator would take the longest. So it fits that pretty well. But there are some drawbacks to this model. And if you look at it really hard, you might spot a couple of them. Um, one of them being, obviously, you might fall off the edge. But says Darren Nez, but that's only if you believe there actually is an edge. What if instead of an edge, there's a four dimensional time space warp? Uh, so the yellow to the yellow and the red to the red, which means if you do start traveling west, rather than falling off the edge, you just go through the four dimensional time space warp and reappear from the east. Continuous travel like Pac-Man, go off the left, come back on the right, um, which isn't a terrible fix. It's certainly better than the, than the, the, the disc model, um, but I've got a better fix for this. I can fix this model even better because if you take that diamond model and hold it in front of you and bend it back, until the yellow bit meets the yellow bit and the red bit meets the red bit, what you get to is a three dimensional object, which is like a low resolution sphere. And if instead of taking just three measurements, you take multiple measurements all the way along the yellow line to see where you come out on the other side and map those up, what you get back to is a sphere. You iterate yourself back to a ball. Um, so I thought it was interesting that Darren had rejected the, the disc model. It was interesting that he was working on another model, but I think it'd be interesting to see whether he could iterate himself back to reality by following his instinct to, to, to ask questions and to follow where it leads. I don't know whether he has the, the, the space and the intellectual fortitude and uh, freedom from ideology to get back to that, but it'd be interesting. Of all the people I met, I thought he was the one who was probably the closest to it. Um, so there's lots of different models of the flat earth. Uh, there's even some that I couldn't get into. There was a one model which took them three hours to explain where the, uh, the universe, the entire universe was an egg. Uh, and they had this huge papier-mâché version of the model there, which was one of the most delightful and uh, balmy things I've ever seen in my life. And it would take me a long time to describe it. And I unfortunately don't have that time uh, here. Um, 
how do we know these aren't true? Let's just do a quick bit of debunking of some of those arguments before we uh, before we finish. The horizon looks flat. The number one argument put forth by flat earthers uh, as of 2017, 2018. This is actually taken directly from a flat earth meme. This is their argument. This is their picture. Show me the, 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 the curve there. This is the horizon. Where's the curve? Well, actually, if we just apply a ruler to their own meme, we can see there is a curve. Because in the center, this line is basically touching. But once you get out to the edge, it falls away enough that you can see there is a gap. And this, I think, is part of the, the explanations for why people were persuaded by flat earth beliefs that shot at the gut level rather than uh, worked on people having to have a working understanding of the physics of the real world. Because we all agree the world looks like this, roughly speaking, 24,901 miles in diameter. Let's call it 25,000 miles uh, diameter. Very few people ever get the privilege of seeing it look like that. Very few people even get to see that much of it or even that much of it or even that much of it. But even just by zooming in on that circle, that same circle, a few times, it looks a lot flatter now than it did to begin with. And this is because this speaks to what's going on here is that we as people, we didn't evolve to be able to compute things at such a large scale as a planet. We, we, we don't have the, the brain uh, that's, that's designed to work with things of that magnitude. We're, we're built to look at or we, we evolved to, to be best at looking and working with things that are within our own purview, things that will keep us fed and watered and safe from predators. So our brain just isn't hasn't evolved to have uh, galaxy level thinking. And so when you need to rely on something being you're looking at the horizon, it's curved, but it's the curve is so subtle you can't possibly comprehend it because you can't comprehend the magnitude and just how big the world actually is. That doesn't feel satisfying to us. And so for some people, they come to the answer that if I can't see a curve, there can't be one. That counterintuitive nature of reality is what a lot of people are rejecting. And it also explains what's going on with this argument about airborne objects, helicopters and cannonballs. Why is it that a cannonball shot north to south doesn't veer off a thousand miles an hour to the east as we spin away from it? Again, it's it's based on not understanding the counterintuitive nature of reality because you're just looking for what you can basically observe without really interrogating what that the, the implications of that are. You know, when the helicopter lifts off the ground, it isn't stationary because the, it was going at a thousand miles an hour when it was on the ground. And when it lifts up, it's got the momentum of, of going at a thousand miles an hour and continues to do so through an atmosphere, which is also spinning at a thousand miles an hour and keeping it moving with it. So everything around it, including the gravitational field it's in, is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. And so relatively, it feels like zero, but actually it is traveling. That doesn't feel true, but I can demonstrate it using this really uh, cool illustration. This is a, a tractor um, pulling a trampoline at 20 miles an hour. And you can see there's a chap lying down in the middle of the, the, the trampoline there, and he's going to start bouncing and he's going to bounce higher than those wooden walls. And your gut tells you when he goes higher than the wooden wall on a trampoline that's moving forwards at 20 miles an hour, it's going to move from underneath him and he's going to splat on the ground because that's what it feels like would happen. But that's not what the physics of the situation actually do. That's not what the physics actually are. What happens instead is on the trampoline, he's going forward at 20 miles an hour. So when he lifts up, he goes in a parabola, roughly speaking, at 20 miles an hour and lands back in almost the same place, give or take a little bit of air resistance, which is what those walls are for. But understanding that you need to really understand the physics of the real world before you can accurately uh, predict what's going to happen. Anybody who comes to that without thinking about it too much will just dismiss it on a gut level, but it's not what's real. And let's talk finally about water. We see a lot of these arguments about water not bending to a curved surface, that it always flows, that it always finds level, it always goes flat on top, that it never goes uphill. Um, this actually was taken from a video uh, that was uh, filmed, I think, by a Lad Bible website at the Flat Earth Convention I was at. And this is a chap proving that the world is flat by pouring a glass of water over his head. He says, you see the water runs off my head because it's a curved surface. The same is true of the Earth. All the water would just run off fundamentally not understanding and not engaging with the physics of the real world. This is another flat earth meme about water. As I mentioned at the start about those hills going uphill to get to the sea. And you can see here, this is one of their own memes that the water starts on top of this hill, but to get to the sea, it's got to go uphill rather than downhill on a curved surface. Whereas if you flatten that curved surface out, it's going downhill to the sea. So they argue this is proof the world is flat because water can't go uphill. It must be flat, so it's going downhill. This is fundamentally misunderstanding what gravity is doing because gravity isn't doing that. They, they assume that gravity is down because at a local level, 
gravity to you will always be down. You don't think at a, at a planet sized level. You don't think at that magnitude. Your own experience is gravity pulls you down. So they assume that wherever you are on a curved surface, down would be down. But that's not the case. They think that model is going to apply there. And so, yes, at the center, it's straight down. But over here, they think down is still down. And therefore, this water is running uphill. That isn't a real model of, of gravity. What gravity is actually doing is pulling towards the center of the curve. So at the top, it goes straight down, but off to the sides, it's more of a diagonal. If I just apply that same model of gravity to that new model of gravity to their own meme, it becomes really clear that the water is running downhill. It's just your concept of down was initially wrong because you didn't, en didn't engage with the physics of the real world. So what I learned from spending all this time talking to flat earthers and people who have other uh, unusual and esoteric beliefs, well, I think I learned a few different, uh, a few different things from it. Um, first of all, people like to say that flat earth is about rejecting science, and I don't think it is. I, I think people want to be scientific. They're not thinking about it at a level that this is an anti-science position. They're thinking about it in the sense that, uh, that this is something else. I think what's really going on here is, first of all, an inability to see through rhetoric. So a well-presented, uh, coherent-looking argument that's built around a falsehood in the center. People just aren't experienced at, at seeing how to pick apart rhetoric these days, really. We don't really teach that as a, as a skill in the same way that we teach science as a skill. But I think more to the point, it's about identity and values. I think once this belief starts to take hold from, from whatever reason that people might have uh, a gap in their life which leaves them open to this belief, once it's in there, it becomes part of who they are. And it's much, much harder to shake at that point. You don't question the fact you agree with, you question the fact you disagree with. And so I think once it's about identity, um, we've seen people who became Flat Earth in 2015 and ran a Flat Earth conference in 2018, gone from three years from finding an idea to becoming so core of who you are that you're flying people from other countries at your own personal expense to talk to you about it. I think that speaks to it fulfilling a need and you need to understand that, that what need it's fulfilling and how people can have that need fulfilled elsewhere before you can start to sort of move people away from it. So we need to understand that it's not them just going, I don't care about science. There's something else going on. YouTube's had a massive hand to play in this through the way that it was actively promoting this stuff to people. And once it stopped promoting Flat Earth, it started promoting QAnon to people. And I would argue if YouTube and Facebook had just as much a, a hand to play in promoting those uh, dangerous conspiratorial ideas. But the thing is, when we talk about Flat Earth, we shouldn't talk about it as one homogenous belief because there's there's variation within the flat earth world. You might believe that the earth is a, a disk, that it's an infinite plane, that it's a dome, that it's the cosmic egg model. Um, there's lots of different versions of flat earth. And if you really want to have a, a productive conversation with someone who's a believer, not just in this particular idea, but more, more generally as a principle, if you want to understand and have a useful conversation with somebody who believes in, uh, in pseudoscience, it's useful first to understand what it is they mean by the things they say, what they actually think, because then you can understand how to start to unpick that. If you assume what they believe, then you're going to have a gap in, in terms of your knowledge of what they're actually thinking and the things you say won't look true. You'll be that person who stumbled into the Flat Earth Forum, uh, assuming that because you knew the globe was round, you could prove all these people wrong and you're not going to do anything. And, and worst case scenario, you'll actually do damage in doing so and persuade people that people like you are wrong even further. So I think it's worth understanding first, but also understand that Flat Earth isn't a single belief. It doesn't exist in isolation. If we treat it like it exists in isolation, we miss the bigger picture. Because yes, you believe the world is flat, but you also believe that the Bible's literally true or that there are signs of Satan everywhere. You believe that the Illuminati and the New World Order are in control of everything and that they may or may not be Jewish. You believe that vaccines are evil, chemtrails are evil, GMOs are evil, flu rides evil, alternative medicine's wonderful. All this other stuff is in there. And I think when you miss that, you miss the real picture that this is a, a, a patchwork of lots of different conspiracies that just, and Flat Earth is merely just one of the symptoms of an underlying cause. I don't think it's about accepting a belief per se. I think it's about rejecting mainstream belief. Once you're outside of the mainstream, you're on my side, which is why people start to snowball and accumulate other things that are outside the mainstream as they piece together this other grand narrative. I think one thing to bear in mind and something that really struck me as I was uh, speaking to people at the Flat Earth Convention was just how many people talked about uh, Flat Earth being, it came to them at a point when they were going through something particularly hard in their life, it, a personal trauma. I was having a really hard time and then I found the truth of Flat Earth and it all made sense. And I think for some people, either a personal crisis or a trauma or even a mental health crisis is enough to make them jump tracks 
onto another conspiracy belief. And even if they recover entirely from that in terms of their own personal well-being, they may not realize that they're on a different set of tracks now and they're heading in a different direction. And so when we talk about the flat earth, we should be really aware that there could be a, a traumatic element to what led people into it. Um, and finally, I would say, if we want to try and help at all, and I think the only reason I'm involved in skepticism is because I, I do want to help. Um, if we're looking to help, then we should think about how best to do that. And for me, I think the way to do that isn't through mockery and through calling names and, and shouting at people and being superior, but it's through understanding them and trying to listen to them first and then help them back out of it. And I think that's really how we can talk to people we disagree with and how we can uh, pull people back from uh, the edge, uh, if indeed there is an edge. Um, thank you so much for, for listening. All right, I am coming in here. Michael, that was amazing. <laughs> amazing. Thank you. Um, very exciting to talk to somebody who's a professional skeptic. And at first I thought, wow, that's my dream job. And I realized how very, very, very difficult. <laughs> um, so, good for you. Uh, we have quite a few questions. I also want to tell you our chat function blew up. <laughs> Excellent, I'm glad. I couldn't keep up with it because I have a little trouble scrolling the Q&A, but um, <laughs> I, we're going past 80. Oh, wow. <laughs> and usually we have about 20. Right, I see. <laughs> really, really got people thinking. So let me get into the Q&A. Um, yeah, the very first question came in at 2 o'clock, and it's, it's interesting because some of the questions since I think you've already answered, but this question is, are there specific ideologies that are sort of gateway drug ideas that lead people towards conspiracy theories? And you, you did just mention mental health crises as, as yeah. a possible trigger, which I, I think is very smart. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, so I, I go beyond mental health crises. I think lots of personal crises that may not be uh, mental health. I, I think it could be people lose their job and feel hopeless a relationship breaks down somebody else that they're very close to is ill i think the thing that leads people in terms of flat earth one of the things that really led people towards it i think was was isolation um when people feel like they don't have connections to people when they feel like they didn't have the whatever community or support structure they had around them failed in some way um whether whatever way that was um I think that's when people turn to uh, grand narrative conspiracy theories to explain what's going on. Uh, and I think in partly it's because if your world, if your world and your life aren't, it's not going the way that you think you'd like it to be. If it, if, if you're struggling with something that feels um, out of your control, these type of conspiracy theories can be a way of, of grasping that control back. Um, which sounds paradoxical when you think that some of it involves there being an evil, shadowy organization who run all everything and, and are responsible for all the evil in the world and everything bad ever happens to you. But it, but if if the alternative of that is that everything pretty much or most of the things that happen, the biggest things that happen in your life happen through random chance, complete uh, circumstance, you know, coincidence, those types of things that I actually think are the, the biggest factors in our lives is just random chance, unfortunately, chaos theory, butterfly effect. Um, that's quite a worrying thing and quite a scary thing to accept that your world can take a massive downturn for literally no reason at all, other than someone's going to be on the, 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 the crappy end of the stick at some point. Um, whereas the reason this is all going wrong is because of them is a much more satisfying world to you because it might not seem like it's going to plan but it is going to a plan it's going to an evil plan but it's a plan nonetheless someone's in in charge someone's steering and if it's someone evil then all we need to do is gather together and and rise up against the evil people or just make everyone aware of the evil people and then it all goes away again so i think it's that that sense of kind of social isolation is is one of the real factors and especially social social isolation that leads you to spend a long time online alone where you're going down these these rabbit holes that the technology is is leading you down not deliberately but also not accidentally you know yeah. youtube doesn't want you to be a flat earther it just wants you to be a, a passionate youtuber it doesn't care what flavor of youtuber you are facebook doesn't want you to be in a q and on group it just wants you to be in a group that keeps you commenting and liking and going back to the platform again and again and again because that's how it serves ads so those two things really were, the, were what got people in um and then beyond that just ideas I'm, I'm not sure if there was a particular idea like a subject matter that gets people in um i, I think it, it's it's more about exposure to small edge small edges of an of uh, of these ideas rather than being hit with a full narrative yeah yeah sounds good 
sounds good. Um, could you briefly describe, you used the term zetetic, I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. So we had a couple people who asked what you meant by that. The oh, that's a good point. Um, you know, I probably can't describe that. That that was the name they chose for it. I, I think it's kind of, I did know, I'm not going to give a very definition, but it's kind of a questioning. Um, it's not a million miles different in definition to skeptic. Um, oh. I know that even I think the French, a French skeptical organization called themselves zetetique rather than skeptic. So it can be uh, that idea of inquiry. But the reason I used it is just because in the late 19th century, that's what the flat earth was called. They they called it, you know, Samuel Rawbotham called his book Zetetic Astronomy. Um, let's let, look at the, the stars, but ask a lot more questions than we would to just obs observation. Let's really examine uh, things a bit, a bit further. Obviously examine them from his own huge ideological bias of creationism and uh, committed flat earther. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't normally use the term zetetic, and it was just in the context that's that's what they called themselves, basically zetetic astronomy. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, we had several different people who asked about the motives of people who fall for conspiracy theories, but I think you just addressed that really well. Hmm. I'm going to pass over that one unless you have something to add. But you, you may, maybe no. I think the only thing I'd add is that uh, it, it's why I try to have sympathy for the people uh, going into it. It's also why I think when we argue directly with them, we end up doing more damage um, mm. because we can assume that they have much different motives. And I don't, and I don't even go as far as with anti-vaxxers. You know, one of the things I think about anti-vaxxers is if we say, if we argue with them in the sense of saying you are baby killers who are putting children in harm's way, not only is that not going to persuade them, it's going to actually convince them that those skeptics they hear about really are as nasty as, as they think, because they think I'm, I deliberately kill children. And obviously I don't deliberately kill children. So these really are the mean, horrible people that I've been told they are. So I definitely won't listen to them. Um, so yeah, if you, if you have a charitable view of people's uh, values, I think um, you'll have a lot more, um, you'll understand them a lot more and be a lot more informed about what they actually think. And also you'll get a lot further in trying to, to persuade them to ask themselves questions because they won't assume that you're evil. And that's very much how James, James Randi explained that. He, he always said, just be gentle. Mm, yeah, absolutely. You don't know what they've been going through. Okay, um, two different questions here that I think are kind of related. One is a, a brief one. Are there reputable scientists who are also flat earthers? And then somebody else asked a very specific question. According to the flat earth map, it seems like the furthest points to travel on their map is from Chile to New Zealand but it's obviously not. Without science, couldn't they just charter a plane from one location to the other and see how long it takes? Yeah, well, so, um, what, sorry, what was the first question there again? I, I just- are, are, there, are there reputable scientists who are also flat earthers? Yeah, not that I'm aware of. I, I, I don't think so. I think they might I be- <laughs> More like engineer. I think it's something that comes up with engineers occasionally. I, I, so I, I'm not saying engineers aren't reputable <laughs> scientists, yeah. um, but I think the, there was a strain of um, people drawn to engineers, most engineering people, not this at all, but some people would see themselves as engineers and therefore um, I can put this together so I can put everything together so I can understand everything and therefore I can tell you that the Twin Towers was uh, a controlled demolition despite having no expertise in that area. So there were a few engineers who were drawn into Flat Earth in that kind of way, but it, obviously not <laughs> many engineers and not uh, reflective of engineering as a whole. Um, in terms of that uh, that Chile to New Zealand thing, um, yes, absolutely. That that is one. That was one of their arguments. Um, I wonder if I've still got it in this uh, in my presentation because I used to have a couple of slides on it, but I, I cut it for uh, for time a while ago. Oh, it's not in this copy of it, unfortunately. Um, they used to say if you look at a flight, if you buy a, a ticket from Santiago to Sydney, is the, the example they would choose. Um, it would go via LA. And I say, why would that make sense? Because Santiago's down here, Sydney's down there, but you'd go all the way up to come down again. That makes no sense until you map that onto a disc and you're almost in a straight line. So it makes sense that you'd stop and refuel in LA. Now, obviously what they're missing is when you fly from Santiago to Sydney and you stop in LA, it's not just fuel you're taking on board. You're letting off people and bringing on more people because not mm -hmm. a lot of people want to go directly from Santiago to Sydney. So you change in the middle because it's just an interchange place, LAX, you know, for exchanging things. Um, so that was an argument I used to use. But actually I found recently 
so many people like the the Chilean uh, tourist board has been doing so has getting more and more people interested in Chile. So there's now a direct flight from Sydney to Santiago, <laughs> and it takes a lot shorter uh, time than than flat earthers would, uh, would would suspect, obviously. But one of the reasons it takes even shorter than we might think is because it it takes a detour over Antarctica because it's quicker to go underneath than to go around. So it's actually even shorter than we think for that reason. So yeah, Sid, the, the Santiago thing is 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 not a, a feather in their cap anymore more unfortunate for them. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Okay, from Stuart Vise, who was our speaker last fall. Mm. Harsh, terrific talk. What do flat earthers say about the many thousands of people who must be involved in the conspiracy to create false photos and keep the conspiracy secret? All those NASA employees, why has no one come forward to unburden themselves of their lies? Yeah, it's 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 one they don't like to really uh, put too much time and and thought into. I think what what we see quite often with flat earthers is they'll find the first thing they can find to dismiss an idea without it really necessarily digging into that idea at the at the level of scrutiny that the idea would warrant or that we would give it. So they would say, well, um, those people working for NASA, NASA's entire budgets uh, are based on the idea that you can explore space. If that was a lie from the start, then all those people's jobs and mortgages and everything are, are, are reliant on that lie. And when they leave, they won't be able to get a job if they come out and say, actually, I was lying the entire time about working for NASA and going well, going into space and stuff. So they'll find very flimsy ways of uh, dismissing it. Um, and I think that's a principle we see quite a lot. Um, and my favorite illustration of that was um, was actually from Iru Landucci in, in his talk. He showed a video of three astronauts on the ISS uh, doing a forward roll. And he said that astronauts keep doing this when they're in space. Why do they all do this? It's because they're all Satanists. This is NASA as a tool of Satan. NASA itself is a word meaning he lies in Hebrew, which isn't true, but why would you bother looking that up? Um, but they're, all, all astronauts are Satanists because they like to do that rather than they're kind of a bit nerdy and they think it's kind of cool if you like rock and roll in space, which I can, I can get. Um, but he said, here's this footage of three astronauts doing a forward uh, somersault in the air in, uh, in the ISS. And one of the, the astronauts loses kind of control of their somersault a bit and looks like they're going to hit their head on something. And he said, you can see that this is all happening on wires. And this lady, she's got spinning and she's out of control on the wires. And you can tell that her colleague reaches across and tugs on the wire to pull her back into, into, into a, a, a normal motion. And he said, and he zooms in really up close so you can see really close what's going on. He said, now, obviously, they photoshopped the wires out, but you can see that they're tugging the wires. And I think they were just tugging at her jumper, basically, the pulling in space. But he said... The, the thing that I loved about it was, he said, we know that happened because look at the third astronaut to distract from what's going on. He sees this going on. He sees that this is going to start giving the game away. So to distract from it going on, he gets a baseball out of his pocket and starts floating it in front of his space. He said, obviously, this can't be real. Obviously, it's got to be faked because why would he have a baseball on the ISS when it costs so much money to send every pound of weight up? So he just happened to have a baseball on him for, for this fake shoot they were doing. And he used that to distract them. I said, right. If that was true, Iru, that would rely on him being able to levitate baseballs because we can see it levitating. We can explain it levitating if he's in space. If this is all done with wires, did he wire up the baseball ahead of time or can he just telekinetically move the baseball? So even in that argument, they went to the pixel by pixel level detail of zooming in on what they thought was happening here, but missed the really obvious thing that undermined their entire point. And we see that with where, what about all these people coming out? Well, they're scared of NASA. They're all Satanists. Their money depends on it. They find the first thing and that's good enough for them to, to throw the whole argument out. Okay. Um, from Susan Gerbic, with my apologies if I am mispronouncing her name, I know, Susan, I know I have heard your last name before. Uh, Marsh, can you comment on why this world conspiracy seems to be dominated by males? Now, personally, I don't know that that's a fact, so I'm going to throw that on you, too. Not just the flat earth, but conspiracies in general. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think... I think it certainly was the case that conspiracy theory more generally was uh, a more male dominated pseudoscience. Um, I think one of the reasons for that is about how we socialize boys and girls from a young age. We tell boys that they're very engineering, they're very left brain, they're very mathematic. And so the, the types of uh, pseudoscience that, that that kind of social conditioning uh, leads men into is, well, I'm going to be able to make sense of everything. And actually, I can put all these pieces together and see the big picture. Whereas society tells uh, girls that they're nurturing and caring and you know motherly and things like that. And, and I think that's 
you know, a, 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 a bullshit <laughs> breakdown into how we are. That's not true about uh, men and women, but it's how society teaches us to be. And so the types of pseudoscience that uh, that 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 target women tend to be more around alternative medicine, caring for people and, and psychics in terms of that kind of ongoing care, even after the dead. So I think that that's my my hypothesis as to why men are more drawn to conspiracy theory. I don't think it's anything innate about the male brain. I don't think that's particularly uh, a contributing factor. I think it's about how we teach men and boys to see the world and how we teach girls to see the world as a society. Um, I think some of that's changing. And one of the ways we see that changing is if you look at how the QAnon conspiracy theory, and I know I keep referencing this and I'm sorry if uh, uh, viewers aren't fully familiar with it, it would be at least one or two of the talks to really flesh out what it means. But it's a, another grand overarching conspiracy theory about the they in control of the world. Um, that really took hold in online spaces that are more targeted towards women recently when it pivoted towards save the children, children are being trafficked into satanic paedophilia. And it really took hold in places like the online yoga spheres and, and Instagram accounts for wellness. Um, and I think, again, using that uh, social constructed idea that women are all about nurturing first and foremost, where those spaces were all about health and well-being and nurturing and, and the, the idea of targeting children got women into this. But then the conspiratorial aspects of QAnon are probably fairly evenly split because there's so much of that kind of what they call pastel QAnon, the, the pastel coloured uh, posts on Instagram that actually are sharing uh, conspiracy theory. So I, I don't know whether conspiracy theory will continue to to change towards a more uh, equitable distribution across society or whether it will uh, regress back into a, a more male dominated uh, targeting. But but that's my theory on it anyway. Interesting. And while you were talking, Rob Palmer, who was um, a speaker for us last year, maybe the year before time goes so fast, he said that he thinks women tend to be anti-vaxxers more. Mm. So, you know, we, we have our own. So here, here's kind of, uh, I usually avoid these types of questions because they ask you to kind of predict the future. But um, that's now of national capital. Okay, we can barely hear you. I was just, I thought that was just at my end. I didn't want to say anything. Um, I am not sure why. I have my volume. Can you hear me now? No, you're just very, very volume. soft. You were fine up until about two, three minutes ago. Okay. Can somebody else take over the Q&A then? Because I don't know. Um, I, my sound is all the way up. And you are still not hearing me. Hello, this is Dereva. I can take care of the Q&A. Can you hear me okay? I, yeah, yes. I, yeah. I, okay, great. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, but if somehow you're quite muted. You're quite muted. Um, okay. Well, good okay. All right. So um, how long should we continue, Becky? Another few minutes or shall we wrap it up? It's almost 3.30. Yeah. Michael, how much time do you have? Um, I can go up until about 10 to 4 your time, I think. So okay. I can go another 20 minutes if you need. Great. And the other thing we need to um, make time for is Ian Bryce being brought on because he will be on. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I, I'm going to go ahead and continue with the Q&A. Um, so one question is, is that a fair assessment that some flat earth believers seem to not be against the science as a philosophy, but they are only against the science as an establishment? Yes, yeah, I'd say so. I think I think many of them see themselves as uh, sort of amateur scientists, and the reason that they come to different conclusions from the establishment is just because the establishment is the establishment, and they've kind of collaborated to uh, withhold the the real truths. And for, for whatever reason, and they might say that's because the established scientists were all taught at established universities and the only thing they ever get taught is to uphold the status quo and not ask the right kind of questions and those who do ask the right kind of questions don't get funding so people either learn to shut their mouths and keep the checks coming in or they move out of science so that's that's kind of what they'd see but one of the things we saw at, uh, at the, the, the flat earth convention i went to was a speaker who'd set up a fairly reasonable scientific experiment he'd set up his kind of camera with a zoom lens in the same spot every single night for like two Two months i think it was and he'd shoot the the same portion of the sky for the same duration time every single night and then he'd put into uh into a spreadsheet uh all, all the coordinates of where where the moon was as it tracked across the sky and then he'd compare those coordinates to the official numbers and he'd find small variances between his figures and the official figures 
And he'd use that to say, you see, the official figures have to be all completely wrong because I've just proved with my own experiment what the, the coordinates actually are. And it, that's not a reasonably, that's not an unreasonable experiment, but it's just lacking in the interrogation of your own methods to say, well, actually, was I putting the camera in exactly the same space it, it, with the same zoom level the, to the millimeter? And are the inaccuracies at my side or the official side? So that's not a bad scientific experiment, but it's not understanding how to yeah, interrogate your own science. So I think they really want to be scientific, but they want the science to support their conclusions. And when the science disagrees with their conclusions, it's because there's something wrong with the science. Good. So what was the best example of a conflicting conspiracy or conflicting conspiracy theories that you've heard from a single person? Oh, gosh, that's interesting. Um, oh, blimey. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure I could uh, I could get there. I know that there are um, there, there are famous studies where people look at things like uh, uh, Osama bin Laden and the people who believe that he was a patsy uh, the entire time also believe that he was never killed. He was, he was a patsy who was bumped off uh, by the CIA in order to uh, keep him quiet. Also believe he was never killed and is still continuing living somewhere. Uh, and I believe it was even uh, predictive that if you believed in one conspiracy theory, you were more likely to believe in a con contradictory conspiracy theory than if you didn't believe in the first one. Um, but I'm saying all that to Pad to try and find whether I, I've got some examples of my own. Um, I suppose my favourite example, and one of the ways that I found um, the... I interviewed a hollow earther once, who was a really interesting chap. I won't go into too, ma too many details, but we spent 20 minutes talking about details of the hollow earth. I asked a question I thought was innocuous, and 20 minutes later he's defending the, uh, the Nazis and denying the Holocaust, and I didn't expect it to go there, but oh there we go. My. Um, but the reason, the way that I found Hollow Earth as a belief is that there was a, there used to be a Flat Earth podcast put out by the Flat Earth Society. And on the second or third episode, they interviewed a Hollow Earther, the one that I later interviewed. And I went into the interview thinking, this is going to be amazing, because obviously they massively disagree. These two worldviews are completely incompatible. But what I found is they didn't really disagree hardly at all. All they did was agree that the one view of the world everyone else has in mind isn't right and so long as everyone else is wrong it doesn't matter what flavor of right right we are between us um so they were quite happy to let glaring inconsistencies in their worldviews uh pass as long as they agreed that the scientific establishment was really trying to control things and all that kind of stuff so that's probably the closest example i probably got a better example if i if i really think about it but i probably won't <laughs> think it up until uh until tomorrow or something like that <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's great. So we have a specific uh, question from Scott Snell, and I'm mentioning Scott, Sc Scott Snell because we had a positive shout out to him early in this talk uh, to thank him um, for uh, mentioning you to us. And Scott mm. says, um, someday space tourism will probably be available to regular folks. And he hopes he lives long enough to see some flat earthers make the journey. He would be curious to see how they would react. There may be a range of responses, including acceptance. But then the question to you is, do you think any of them would take a ride? And do you think they would change their minds as a result? Um, I think they would definitely take it because I think what they're looking for is to prove themselves right. And they're not worried about accidentally proving themselves wrong because they, they think they're absolutely right. Um, so I think they would take it. I think what they, what they, how they respond to it would very much depend on how, how deep into the flat earth world they were. I think some might accept it. I think I'd like to think Darren Nesbitt would accept it. Um, because I think he's got a different model of the world in his head anyway, and I think he's also someone who the conversation that I'll put out uh, that I had with him next week, the conversation I'll put out next week that I had with him already. Uh, in that, he actually changes his mind on a few things when when presented with counter evidence. So I think he, someone like him, would accept it. I think others would just um, believe that what they're seeing wasn't real. Because mm -hmm. yeah. when, once space travel is uh, is a tourist industry, we won't be uh, doing spacewalks on the outside of uh, of uh, the ships. I don't imagine we'll be looking at it through at best windows, probably more likely computer screens. And so 
they'll just see it as well of course they're going to carry on showing us the picture of the flat of the earth being round even though we're outside of a a, a flat earth because they're not going to let us accept the truth so they'll always find what find ways to uh rationalize out of there um and the ones who accept it will just turn out not to have been flat earthers like they yeah. believe they were flat earthers they'll see the evidence they'll change their mind and the entire flat earth community will say oh they were never flat earthers in the first place they were always paid chills whose entire job was to get to this point and denounce flat earth at the very end so they'll always find ways to do that too the flat earth community was very very good at ejecting people who were previously the leaders of the movement and when they ejected them, i think many people don't believe mark Sargent is was it, not only is he no longer a flat earther in their minds he was never a flat earther a guy I met at the UK convention said, oh yeah, Mark Sargent, he was a shill the entire time. But the same guy was repeating to me the talking points that Mark had in his videos and saying he saw them in Mark's videos. So I was, well, how come you're saying you were persuaded to believe the world is flat by someone you now think is a liar, but you're still believing the things he said when he lied? Like, where is the consistency here? So um, yeah, it's not a, a worldview that, uh, that tends towards consistency. Yes, thank you. Good. Um, so uh, two related questions. Are there reputable scientists that you know about who think the Earth is only 6,000 years old or who and or who support homeopathy? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're there. Um, I mean, someone like Luc Montagne, for example, uh, Dr. Luc Montagne, a French doctor who uh, I think won a Nobel Prize for his work in HIV research is now uh, putting, has been for some time putting forward the idea that water can contain energies of other things and, and that ends up uh, supporting homeopathy. Um, so it, it definitely happens. And, and it, I don't believe there are any uh, reputable geologists who think the world is 6,000 years old. Um, but there are definitely people who are, who've got geology degrees and even geology PhDs who think that um, they don't want to be reputable in their field. They got that in order to say, I'm a geologist and I believe this. But I think that's one of the things that we, we, we kind of know is that um, people who can be very brilliant in one area can be completely wrong in another area. And one of the unfortunate things is the more brilliant you are in one area, the, the more used you, are, used you are to being brilliant, which can lead you to, to miss your own ideological gaps and your own, uh, your own fallibilities. So yeah, the problem is smart people are just people and people who are very smart are really good at believing nonsense because they're really good at justifying to themselves why the nonsense is true because it must be true because i believe it and i'm really smart so yeah they're very good at finding justifications unfortunately mm. good um okay so um one of our attendees was asking that it's their impression that flat earth believers will champion contradictory flat earth models, maybe even a hollow earth model, yet will not consider any sphere earth evidence or spherical earth evidence. Um, why do you think that is? Yeah, I think it's just because um, for a lot of people, it, it's not really about what shape, shape the world is. It's just about what shape the world isn't. And I, and I met someone at the, the conference who was actually selling merchandise and we asked him about that and we said, isn't it strange how the last guy got up and pointed out how that disc model cannot possibly be true and showed you really obvious reasons why. And then the next guy got up and started saying he believed the disc model and no one in the audience seemed to bat an eyelid at that. And he said, look, I don't really mind whether it's round, whether it's, whether it's a disc, whether it's a diamond, whether there's a dome. All I know for certain is it can't possibly be a sphere. That's all that matters to me. And I think that's kind of what's going on here is there's a kind of a collective outgroupness is that once you're in the outgroup, once you're not part of the in-group, once you've rejected the mainstream, you can be outside of the mainstream together, even if you're shoulder to shoulder with someone who's who's completely who's, whose worldview is completely different to yours. They are your uh, your your intellectual fellow traveler because the two of you will be against everyone else together. And I think once you've the other thing is I think is that once you've eject, once you've rejected the mainstream once and you find yourself in a, a sub community, it's much harder to reject what that sub community thinks because where are you going to go next? And I think that's why people who might come to that movement just thinking that the world is flat might then start to think well actually you're right about vaccines and actually you're right about gmos and actually you're right about the protocols of the elders of zion and who the new world order really are because it's easier to go along with what your outgroup thinks than to find yourself on the outside of two groups good well um there's one more uh, question and then we will wrap up for the day um do you have any thoughts about why flat earth conspiracy theories and other conspiracy theories tend to be dominated by males? 
over females. I, I think I, I answered that one already. Actually. Oh, you answered that one. Okay. Yes, yeah, that was the one. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. since I took over the Q and A. Okay, no great. <laughs> um, so we've wrapped up on our questions. Is there anything else you'd like to to say before we wrap up? Yeah. Um, the one thing I like to leave people with uh, is that people often ask me, how do you like someone in my life believes in X? What do I do about it? how do I persuade them to, to change their mind? And it sometimes comes up with flat earth. More often now it comes up with stuff like QAnon or, or anti-vax and stuff like that. And I always like to give people this 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 analogy, which is um, imagine an asteroid going to hit the earth. The way that Hollywood deals with that is to send up Bruce Willis with a team of miners and a nuclear bomb to blow that asteroid up. And realistically, what would happen is all those shards of asteroid are still on a collision course with Earth, and it's just going to be widespread de devastation. And when there's someone in your life who believes in something that's completely untrue, and you Bruce Willis them, you go head on and say, you're wrong, you're an idiot. All that happens is a big explosion, widespread devastation. You're not going to change their minds. Um, but if we talk to astrophysicists about how we actually plan for an asteroid impact, and one of the ways they, they talk about avoiding it now is that you spot that the asteroid's coming and you send up something, uh, a probe or something like that, that's got enough mass to it that it hangs around next to the asteroid and the gravitational pull of the probe slowly over time alters the direction and the path that that asteroid's on. And over time that, that pull is, that the gravitational pull is subtle enough, but over time the cumulative effect is that it changes the course and it's no longer gonna hit Earth and it's gonna, gonna miss us. And that's how you change people's minds that you love. You don't try and do it all in one go. You don't try it by, do it by telling them how wrong they are. You try and do it through gentle persuasion. You stay around them. You stay the person that they love and care for and respect. And you ask them little questions that aren't there to try and challenge them, but are just there to make them think. And you say things like, well, that's interesting, but help me understand this. When I, when I think about it, I find this problem. Help me overcome this problem rather than you're wrong for this reason. And if you do that, maybe you can get them to change their mind. Um, just don't expect them to ever tell you they've changed their mind because that's the hardest thing any of us do. And uh, people don't like to do it. But that's that's my analogy on how to, uh, how to, to slowly persuade people that you uh, love and care about without losing them. Well, thank you so much. And many people in the chat are supporting, uh, loving, loving that methodology. Excellent. I'm glad to Great. hear it. So, I hope you never have to put it into action. <laughs> so thank you for speaking with us today. Um, I'd like to wrap up and say that our next fact meeting, which will be online, will be March 20th at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. We will put this out on our website, www.fact.org, as well as our meetup our Facebook, and we have an email list as well. And our speaker is going to be Ian Bryce, and Ian happens to be here with us. So Ian, would you like to um, say, say hello and say what you're going to speak about? Oh yes, hello everyone. Um, here in Sydney, we're all wearing our seat belts, of course, so we don't fall off the bottom of the earth, <laughs> as we always do. In fact, aeroplanes fly upside down for that reason. <laughs> okay, next month's talk will be on it's some investigations, scientific investigations by Australian skeptics. We've been around since 1981 and I've been investigating scientific claims for 40 years. We have a hundred thousand dollar prize for any evidence of the paranormal, although that in recent years that's turned towards more towards the pseudoscience. Several of our investigations have been international in nature. For example, there was the Australian who claimed he could communicate with a colleague in New York via telepathy. So we arranged a test in with a, a group of uh, New York skeptics at a certain time, all scheduled and set up at some effort. And um, it turned out that he was unable to communicate. In fact, the other, his receiving group on, in New York never turned up. And it turned out they existed only in his imagination, we think. So, so that was a case of the Indian spirit guide who wasn't there. And um, another one you might have heard of is the Italian Andrea Rossi's ECAT free energy machine runs on cold fusion. So I've been investigating that since about 2012. And three NASA scientists and 17 other scientists witnessed his tests and said they couldn't see any way it could work. Anyway, it could be a trick. They'd examined all wires and pipes, and it must be real, must be real cold fusion. So I figured out what it was eventually and reported that he was using an earth wire to smuggle in extra power. And I thought that was a pretty mean trick because earth wires are there for a purpose and it's called safety. 
And if you're repurposing it to put in 240 volts on an earth wire, that's quite dangerous. So that was written up in the Skeptical Inquirer in, 20, in 2019, if you'd like to read more about that. And a, f a few of the other things we'll talk about, the, the non-free energy ones. In Australia, we have an Aquapole rising damp repeller. A lot of houses in Sydney suffer damp that comes up from the ground through the bricks and makes the paint blister and so forth, called rising damp. And you can buy this device you hang from the ceiling. It doesn't need batteries or internet connection or anything. And it drives the moisture back down into the ground. Amazing. The only, the only trick is it takes a year to do so and that you have to do lots of other changes at the same time. For example, better drainage in the ground and fixture roof and fix your gutters and so forth and your downpipes. So we, th we think that the $7,000 you pay for a rising damp repeller might be bad value. And each year we often go to the Mind, Body and Spirit Festival in Sydney where they have all sorts of devices on sale. And uh, last time I went there, we succeeded in getting thrown out as we're asking too many embarrassing questions of the people selling devices. So there's some of the things we've investigated. Another one you might have heard of is, is the power balance, a rubber strip you put around your hand. And our Richard Saunders showed that he could reproduce all of the tests they do. It's claimed to improve your, improve your balance, strength and flexibility. It's easy to duplicate those through simple using properties of the body. And he demonstrated on television how that worked. And then they went out of business in Australia. So occasionally we do put someone out of business. In fact, we ruined many business plans. So there's some of the things that I'm going to be talking about next month. Good. We look forward to it. So we'll see you next month. Thank you everyone for attending and supporting FACT. Thank, Thank you, you so everyone. And thanks so much, uh, Michael. Excellent talk. Look forward to hearing you next month, Ian. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much.